Come on, man. I love the box. The box is one of my favorite things in this planet. It really is. What's shaking? Welcome back to the All In Podcast with Rick Jordan. I'm here today with Justin Rule. What's up, brother? Hey, man. Uh, I don't know what's up. We, we People are voting, so there's a lot up or down, depending yeah, where you're Yeah, so when this post, it's going to be like a month after Election Day. And I have, I mean, we're hopeful today. I mean, I voted today, which is fantastic. You know, I'm sure you did, too. Yeah, man. If, if we have results by the time this thing airs, then uh, I think the world will be happy, but... <laughs> Right on. I'm in, I'm in Pennsylvania and everyone's fighting over here. So, dude, they sure are. Absolutely. I think everybody's fighting all over the United States right now. But we're used to that, right? We come from a church background, both you and I. We're used to people fighting with each other. Dude, we know how to fight. Uh, uh, how would you say? Scripturally. <laughs> Scripturally? I don't know about that. People use some <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes in the church, man, people can use harsher words than the general public do. Yeah, that's a true story. I know, Sad man. Story. I know, which is, which is interesting to me because I love it because I always come back to two things, man, and it's just love God and love others. Beyond that, it's like let everybody else figure it out on their own for real. Right, <laughs> if you that's stick right. to that, that's what that's what life is, isn't it? Dude, learning how to love your neighbor, yeah. Learning how to love God, those are the two. Yeah, for sure. Right. Well, let's dive in, man, because I, I know a lot of your story, and you were born what three and a half months early. Is that right? I was, man. That, that's no misprint. Um, yeah, I was born at the wow. end of the second trimester. Um, and uh, I was diagnosed as being uh, deaf, having cerebral palsy, and uh, given a 10% chance to even live, period. So, yeah, we could dig into that. I mean, it was... Yeah, please. How did that, you know, how did that journey affect the person you are today, too? I mean, it was... An interesting thing was that <clears throat> when my, uh, my mom went into labor... And the doctor said, hey, like, this is you or the baby. Like, I don't know if this is going to end too well. So, you know, that's funny because that's a hot topic right now in the news in terms of how do you make that choice? Yeah. And, um, she said, well, you know, I'm going to have this baby. So um, I came out and, uh, you know, again, this is so I'll date, I'm 38 years old. So what they do back then is they put you in the incubator and uh, hook Just you up pray. on a bunch of yeah, exactly right, man. Yeah, yeah. And the, doc, the doctor said, "Hey, if uh, Justin lives, it's going to be stubbornness that is the only reason he survives, and it'll be the very reason why you wish he didn't survive some days." So, yeah. let's back this up real quick because you're talking about the hot topic, you know, that's going yeah. on. Of course, it, it's the hot topic any election year. You know, yeah, right. It, when the doctor said this isn't going to go well, was he talking about you or was he talking about your mom's health or both? Uh, both. I mean, he said, basically, you know, I don't know if Justin will survive, but if you go through with this, you know, I don't know what your situation is going to be again. This is, this is almost 40 years ago. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Um, like we were I in had, the dark ages. What are you saying, man? Are you saying we're really old? I mean, I'm 41. Hey, man, yeah, no. <laughs> dark ages. <laughs> kind of, there was no like med MD internet search there. Yeah. Where we were, we were yeah, talking the eighties uh, anyways. Right. I mean, that was the dark ages. I mean, let's look at the musical situation <laughs> that happened during the eighties. That was a train wreck. <laughs> yeah, well, we won't admit whether or not we listen to '80s music. Yeah, just, right on. Uh, Some of it's okay, but then others, yeah, okay. I mean, we were coming out of disco. I'm, I'm chasing squirrels here, but d- dude, the, <laughs> when somebody gives your mom, I mean, did your mom ever go into that story? You know how she felt in that moment when they said, "Hey, you're you're not going to make it," because I'm assuming they gave her a choice, right? Whether to have you or to abort you. Yeah, I mean th- that was that was what was kind of insinuated and I haven't really dug in to be honest with the, the actuals with my mom in terms of, um, you know, I was number five in the train. So she, you know, she knew her doctor well, or her doctor knew that really was an option. He was just trying to say like, we don't, we don't have answers for this, man. This kid's coming out early. I mean, end of second trimester. Wow. Um, so I weighed two pounds, four ounces. I mean, that baby doesn't survive. Um, and in fact, um, to get, get into it, man, the, when I came out, obviously I was in this incubator, my family, no one could even like see me for months. Um, couldn't like handle you. You had like put your hand through gloves. It's just this weird space looking stuff, you know, like, and um, the, the crazy part was that for, I, I was deaf for 18 months, like literally didn't respond to sound, nothing. I mean, 
uh, I could tell you that. Here's a crazy thing. Bef- before I was born, my late grandmother was flipping through her Bible the day my mom went into labor. And check this out. She came to this verse in the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 118, and it says, he will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. And my Plymouth brethren, <laughs> <they're> <laughs> those <grandma>. guys, <laughs> yeah, right. Who did like prophetic, you know, words from God. I mean, that really wasn't their thing. She calls my dad and my mom and says, dude, I think, I think this baby's going to be okay. I just came across this verse. So and my, my grandma continued to like have these crazy, like verses. I, I, I'd love to tell one of those stories, but like, so my mom had hope. She had faith. And she knew that, look, I'm going to, I'm going to go through with this birth and trust God with this baby. That's fantastic. There's a lot of people that will just lean on that. You know, and, yeah. and in those moments, I've always seen this, you know, cause I, everyone's like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to pray for strength, you know, in this moment, or I'm going to pray for an answer. And this is why I said that, you know, the church world and me, cause I'm, I'm an ex pastor, man, don't get along too well, because what I believe is that God pretty much gave us everything that we already needed to go through life to fulfill our purpose on this planet. Mm-hmm. You know, so in that moment, you know, I can see your mom kind of actually falling into where I, I fit on the end of the spectrum is that she's like, yep, I'm good because I know that I'm already good. And I know that this baby's going to be already good. So, yeah. I mean, isn't that like the most simplistic faith is saying that God already gave me everything that I needed to get through this moment. I don't have to ask him for a specific outcome because I know my purpose and I know that my unborn son has a purpose on this planet. So I know regardless that everything's going to be cool and I'm just going to thank him for that rather than beg him for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we start telling the man upstairs, the outcomes that he's got to do to prove that he's real or to make us cool with life, you know what I'm saying? That now we start crossing lines, dude. Right? That's, that's like abdicating our own responsibility to faith, isn't it? And saying I'm gonna, ha- I'm going to try to make God have faith for me, hmm. rather than me have faith in Him, yeah, and right. what He's already given me, and what He's already laid out for my life. See, this is why the Plymouth Brethren and I don't get along either. <laughs> but it's wow. it's it's like it's more simplistic, isn't it? And it's more empowering because it's not being lazy. It's just saying that I know what my purpose is. And I know that it's my responsibility to step into that. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well said, man. I I can't add to what you said. I mean, it's well said. Dude, I like you. This is a fun conversation. I never expected it to go this way. All right. So you, you were born, obviously, three and a half months early. And I know what three and a half weeks early looks like because that's where my twins we're at, you know, and they were five pounds and six pounds as twins. I mean, that's big. <laughs> it's still at three and a half months premature, if you want to call it that. But you were what, two pounds something? Yeah, two, two pounds, four ounces. Wow. And, uh, you know, I got some photos I should we'll, maybe we'll put on your thing, but of, of what that really looks like. Obviously, like, OK, can this kid hear? Is he going to be normal? Like, how's he going to develop? Um, I had five of the six symptoms of cerebral palsy. So like, I literally still have the documents from Ohio State Medical University that were sending me to like, it literally says like five of the six symptoms of cerebral palsy, recommend going to see the specialist. You know, my mom would take me to physical therapy as a, as a young child because my the way my body was just contorted. And, you know, there's no reason why, you know, age five, those symptoms were all gone. There's no reason why. You know, like I was deaf until 18 months. Dude, can I tell the story about 18 months though? Just dude, crazy. Tell it. Dad. What happened in 18 months? So, dude, my um the high state medical team was like, hey, this deafness could be at the eardrum, the ear canal, or the brain stem. Now, we could maybe can figure something out depending where the issue is. We might be able to fix something. So check it. The night before I go into the surgery, who comes? My late grandma. She's reading in her Bible. Check this out, man. In the book of Matthew, Jesus sends his dudes to John the Baptist's dudes and says, uh, I'm sorry, I flipped it. John the Baptist sent his dudes to Jesus' dudes and said, hey, how do we know you're the real deal? And literally in Matthew, Jesus says, go tell John, the deaf hear, the blind see, the lame are made to walk, the poor have the good news preached to them. By this, you know, I'm from the Father. Check this out. My dad's name is John. (laughs) 
So my grandma was reading, go tell John. She picks up her phone and she's like, John, I just read the Bible verse. You can't make this stuff up. You can't make this up. And the next day, the doctors go in, they put me under. So again, like 38 years ago, putting a little 18 month under, check my eardrum, check my ear canal, check my brainstem. They're like, what the world? Why can't this kid hear? Everything looks fine. They bring me up out of anesthesia. I could hear. And you can hear. No, like no reason. No, it's crazy. Dude, I love the, I love stories like this because there, there's literally nothing that you could have done. Yeah, right. You know, I mean, even as an 18 month old, there's nothing that you could have done to perpetuate anything like this, no. you know, and maybe, maybe it was something chemically or whatever it is. Does it really matter? I know, for, right? For, yeah. And that's, that's like the point because even regardless, we always look for answers, right? And mm-hmm. we always even look for the supernatural. And this is, this is another reason why I don't get along with most, most church going folks is because it's almost like, I also feel that God put a lot of natural things in place already Absolutely. and we're meant to tap into those. Wow. And that's why the knowledge exists for doctors. You know, Absolutely. so when you're looking at, at miracles, you know, it could have been something that was even like a chemical alteration in your brain that just putting you under with the anesthesia that they gave you that all of a sudden just opened it up. And I'm not, dude, I am not diminishing in the slightest the quote unquote miracle well, in that. So to, me, so to me, a miracle is just like supernatural. So it's the soup, it's the natural, like superfied, right? It's, it's things that would <laughs> like amplified. Opinion, That's awesome. <laughs> but like, if you think of it, like, so we get sick with whatever thing is going around, whether it's COVID or whether it's a flu or whether those are both the same. No, just it, it wasn't trying to open up any worms there. Just playing. Dude, open it. <laughs> Unpack it. Come on. Just a whole can. Let's do it. <laughs> but here's the deal. It, when you get sick and you have like literally this thing attacking your body, like trying to destroy cells, like whatever the sickness is over time, like over a week, over 10 days, over whatever your healing process is. Here's, here's how I've come to, again, going from a Plymouth Brethren closed congregation, dude, to like, I could tell you crazy stories. I ain't that anymore. That's for sure. To freedom. Like, Can I just say oh, it going yeah, from that absolutely. to freedom? Yeah. The freedom <laughs> to like, God is real. He still speaks, whatever. Um, but here's the crazy thing that I realized is like a miracle is just what would naturally have happened sped up. In my, that's the simplest way I can say it. Like, so if I said, if I see somebody's <laughs> leg, this, busted and I pray for it and it, it heals. Is that a miracle? Or is that just the natural process of healing already sped up? To me, it's the same. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, what if, happens one day when eyes, if one day all eyes are going to see and you know, and all pains going to be wiped away and it just happens in that moment that you're praying or talking to someone, then how is that not God? How is that not the supernatural? What? All right. We'll we jump off the box. <laughs> I love, come on, man. I love the box. The box is one of my favorite things in this planet. It really is. And I get on it too often. Maybe people will tell me, but I don't really care because I'm just going to keep talking. You know, it's how it is. And I hope you do too, for real. Because you've got to be like one of the most grounded individuals that I've ever spoken to that has come from a ministry perspective. And I say that as an incredible compliment, man, because it, and this is what I would encourage anybody that's going to church or anybody that's in ministry today that might be listening is don't get wrapped up in church. Why would you want to get wrapped up in church? Because it's coming back to love God, love others. And look at what happened this year, man, with COVID. The church freaking blew up. Like almost non-existent, right? What happened? People were scrambling, and I started watching these virtual services, you know, just looking around and seeing what people were doing. And everything. And there's one, uh, there's a pastor friend of mine who's very similar to you, just very extremely grounded. And they had bought a building, you know, a a 100,000 square foot high school to move their church into three weeks before COVID hit is when they closed on this thing. Yeah. And it's something that I donated to. And they were like plugging away at the renovations, everything like, Rick, it's great. You got to come over and see what your money's done for us. And I'm like, yeah, man, I'll come see it. And in the middle of that, when COVID, I'm like, dude, you got to stop. Like the floor is going, I'm like, stop the floor, <laughs> you know, literally <laughs> stop the floor because you've got to adjust and you've been given an opportunity now. And thank God they, they listened to me in that moment because again, it's like, it's just the natural things, right? That were sped up. And I feel that way almost with this year with the pandemic is that the natural evolution or rather dismantling 
of the church as we've known it in the Western world, which was going to happen anyways, was just sped up. Yeah. No, dude, that's like for me, the, uh, the, if I, just to be personal about it, man, when, when COVID hit, like I was, I've been a part of this church that um, I guess it was almost 13, 14 years that was a plant and not, nothing wrong with it. I mean, they honestly, that church experience um, transformed and shaped very much who I am from who I was just, you know, a of decade course. ago. Yeah, that's and awesome. Challenged so much of what I thought the box that I had got in. They, they just blew up. That's it, isn't it? But yeah. here's the crazy thing is that when COVID hit, what I began to just get super just challenged on is like, here's, here's what happened for the, the Western church. We no longer, quote unquote, could safely gather. And everyone started to have issues with that. And I was struck by the, the simple question of when I read my Bible, how often do I hear like the call to gather as much as the call to go? Ooh. And I'm like, you know what? This is the this is why the church is uncomfortable is because we can no longer say, everybody, come to my thing where it's nice and comfortable, where you meet on my terms. And we were just suddenly challenged. What does it mean to be the church and to go, as Jesus said, into all the world and share the good news? Right. It's a lot harder to go and love your neighbor than it is to, quote, unquote, tell your neighbor to come to my cushy little place where we serve coffee and watch a good movie every Sunday. Call it church. No joke, man. My, my pastor friend that I was telling you about, they ended up producing an Easter video and it was okay. just extremely well done. And their church is about maybe 500 people, 500 congregants. And when he produced this video, which was, it was intense. I'll have to send it to you. It was just um, absolutely amazing. Within like the first two hours, it had 9,000 views. Wow. And it, they're like, Rick, we're reaching people in China. Like literally we're reaching people in China that are watching this all wow. over the world. This has gone. I'm like, see, this is what was supposed to happen anyways. And what was going to happen over the next decade now has been accelerated to right now. And dude, this isn't even just church either. This is business. This right. is lives. This is relationships. Cause you talk about divorce rates kind of skyrocketing. And I don't know where you're at on divorce being a, a Christian, but divorces that would have happened anyways have probably been accelerated at this point. And mm. I almost see all of this, all of this, even though people died, which is tragic. You know, it, it always sucks when anybody has to die. And yeah. I would, if I could wave a magic wand or say a prayer and take all those lives back, man, and bring them back, I would, if that's mm. the way that it was meant to be. But you always look at what happens before great triumph and great just joy is always a great tragedy. Mm. And even when you look back in the Bible, what happened? How much war was in the Bible, dude? And yeah. how much freedom came after every single war? And how much triumph came, triumph came after every single tragedy? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't believe God wastes pain. So I think it's always Say for that again. Of, I don't believe that God wastes pain. That's uh, killer. So wow. even if you're like a good old staunch Plymouth brother and raised man, <laughs> I mean, dude, I love them because they're people <laughs> <laughs> because they're human beings. Like what, what's, what struck me one day is like, again, and I don't mean to polarize anyone listening, but if it, it, the narrative of the Bible in the, the declaration, if you will, of the Bible is that Jesus came in and took the payment for our sin uh, so that we could be reconciled to God. And so, you know, we, we joked about the uh, 39 less one lashes or whatever, but <laughs> to me, I've always struggled with like, wait, that, like, you know, so to speak, God, why did you inflict so much pain? Or why was it, you know, if Mel Gibson's uh, passion wasn't even close to reality, like, man, that's still kind of messed up. But then one day I felt like it kind of dawned on me that realization of God doesn't waste pain and he, and it's always for a purpose. And it, there's always, um, yeah, it, then there was no extra, um, that wasn't needed in order to take that place and that punishment. So if that makes sense, like, I don't understand why, you know, people have died from COVID. I don't understand why yeah. good friends lose parents to cancer in yeah. weeks. I don't understand that. And I guess it comes down to, for me to a faith thing that like, um, pain all serves a purpose. Any, anybody understands that that works out. Anybody understands that the trains. Pain always is for a purpose. So how is that? Why, why couldn't that also be true in, in life and in the situations that we find ourselves in? For sure. 
the only place that I don't want to see people go to because, dude, the God, I love that phrase that God doesn't waste pain. And I hope that that lifts up anybody that's listening today because it's meant to in that aspect. I will challenge anybody that's listening also to not say that, oh, well, I should stay in pain then. Because sure. that's, I've seen that a lot, you know, in the Christian culture, like, you know, God's called me to suffer. God doesn't call you to suffer. That's not who he is. You know, he's called to bring you out and to lead you into, not to keep you in a place of suffering. You know, and that that's almost like minimizing and putting God back into a box because it's you starting to write a story for yourself in that moment to say, you know what, I'm okay staying here. Maybe I get some more attention from people because I'm here. Maybe, uh, you know, it might actually make somebody else love me again because I'm staying here and they see me suffering and they don't want to leave because now they feel like they have to stick around, you know, and that's, yeah, I see you. Sorry, go for it. You want to say something, man? (laughs) No, no, no. I, I agree with you. I mean, there's not like a cookie cutter, you know, thing I do. I have seen God use suffering to, to refine and to bring about a lot of good things, but I totally agree with you. Don't, it doesn't mean stay in a place where you're being abused, tormented um, by someone else or to kind of put on that like, you know, a woe is me type idea that like, I'm just going to stay here because, um, but God absolutely does. I mean, it, in COVID, like small businesses, I mean, there was a, an aspect of like suffering and loss, but like the fruit of those things, the fruit of that pruning, the fruit of that kind of challenge, the fruit of that, however you choose to phrase it. Um, if you are trained by it, if you're adapting to it, if you're responding to it, absolutely can be fruitful. And that's the point too, right? Is the response that you have to any sort of suffering. And it's all, it always comes down to a choice in that moment. And it's not, what is it? It's a choice of faith and stepping into really who you are supposed to be. Because yeah. I, coming back to this is full circle, man. And then I'll ask you a question. We might move on, but dude, I'm enjoying our conversation. Yeah. I really am because God has given you everything that you need. He always has. And there's nothing that you need to pray for at any point in time for him to give you. Just ask him to give you the ability to recognize the choices that you should make yourself you know, in the process because he's already given you the strength. He's already given you the intelligence. He's already given you the resources to make any of those choices happen. Yeah, it's, 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 there's a scripture that you're, is almost like you're almost quoting there in like First Peter, I think it is, um, where it says like his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. It's a, and then it says through the knowledge of him. Um, and that's the, that's the interesting thing. Like if you look at, if you'd even look at my life story, man, like I, when I was trying to do it all, figure it all out and have it all like on my own, in my own strength, I don't know, I was failing miserably. Um, so until I really understood, all right, God, I think you, so you're the one that made me, you're the one that <laughs> helped me survive that birth process, man. You, you probably have a little more, uh, wisdom that I'm just trying to figure out on my own. Probably. Maybe I'm making the wrong choices in these moments. You know, maybe I'm fighting against what you gave me and I'm just ignoring it, (laughs) ignoring everything you gave me. Maybe I'm ignoring strength and I'm choosing a place of weakness instead. Uh, That's, (laughs) oh, this is a, you're getting me pumped up today, man. Good stuff. So uh, there's a, (laughs) this is cool. This is a question that I have in front of me here because I, I love it. You've gone through a lot of different things in life. You know, it's jobs, careers, you know, schooling, you were a teacher, right? And then then a pastor, now you're a website designer. You know, what would you tell your younger self about finding your calling, (laughs) about (laughs) your purpose? (laughs) Man, that's a good question. Uh, With five kids, it's, 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 that's got legs on it too. What am I going to tell my kids? (laughs) Yeah, man. Yep. Um, I think what I'd say is it's not, it's okay that it's not a straight path. And that it's, um, it's got some bumps. And um, I think if I knew uh, that it was okay to not have it figured out by 18, 21, 24, 30, or 38 yet, if someone just said, like, that's cool, man, it's, it's all about the journey and the process. It's not so much about the product or the outcome, then I would have embraced the process a lot more. I would have enjoyed the process a lot more. Um, you know, if your mentality is, man, I got to figure this out and it doesn't feel like it's quite working, whatever you're doing, but you don't realize that 
that is the very thing you're supposed to be learning. That process, that, that uncomfortable, being, being more comfortable with what's uncomfortable, that's what you're supposed to be learning right now. Then I would have embraced it more, but instead I feel like I was always like, Ah, well, if this isn't going to work, what am I supposed to be doing next? You know, yeah, no of kidding. That's embracing a, the process. right on because it, it's. Um, I've always had a heart or a, a drawing towards like the eighteen to twenty-five year olds. You know, kind of that university college age group, and it's because I saw myself with my dad dying when I was sixteen. You know, thrust into adulthood. You know, mm. and then I started thinking about well, when most people are eighteen, at least in the United States, all of a sudden. Like overnight, you don't have minor like legal laws that are holding you back, no curfews, no nothing. You can go out and buy anything you want to. You can sign legal contracts in that moment. So you're pretty much free from any legalities that exist that were holding you back before. And also within like a three month time period from the time when you graduate high school to when you go to a university, you're expected to know what you're going to do for the rest of your life. It's probably like one of the most, and even if you go before that, because you're almost supposed to start choosing this even a couple of years before that, like midway through high school (laughs) and nobody does, you know, because you get to that point to where you're 18 and you graduate from high school. It's like, well, now the reality of everything just hit me. I was like thinking about, yeah, this would be nice to do, to be a fireman, to be a a doctor, whatever it is. But now I really, really, really have to choose and move forward. And I, it's interesting because finding your calling, the, the 20s, that time period is really like figuring things out. You know, and I, I've heard this from businessmen before, too. It's like, you know, your 20s to 30, in your 20s, go ahead. You know, just do everything that comes at you yeah. for right. real because you're not, it's not a straight path, like you said. And then when you get into your 30s, you know, now you've probably made some money a little bit and you can actually afford to take risks. In that moment to where if you want to try something new or branch out or take a little tangent over here because you started to kind of hone in on what you were really good at. You figured that out in your 20s. And then when you get in your 40s, it's like, you know what? It's not time to mess around anymore you know, because you've made money, but now you've had a lot of time. So if you look at it that way, that's the process, bro, isn't it? Going yeah, through no, that and making mistakes. Cool. Yeah. Make mistakes and be cool with them. And that long-term view, I like that. I even like that, like decade by decade, instead of like (laughs) figured out by 18 or if not by 21. Dude, there's so much pressure on those that are in their teens. It's horrible. It's horrible. And even if they say, I'm going to take a year off and then all of a sudden there's judgment that comes down on them because I mean, look at it, the stupid number. It's stupid, man. It's ridiculous. It's like 26% of Americans actually go into the field of work that they're, that they achieve their degree in from a university. It's one out of every four. That's it. Yeah. That means three out of four are working like Taco Bell or they, (laughs) they tried to work their way up through some other corporate ladder, or maybe they became an entrepreneur. I only went to to college for two weeks. That's it. And I said, screw this. You know, (laughs) this is just (laughs) too slow pace for me. I was still involved in ministry at the time. And then I ended up getting ordained several years later, but that was the same thing. That was never a straight line for me either. So finding your calling is something that is a process. It's not something that you should ever be expected to figure out overnight. If someone judges you for that, tell them to go pound sand. (laughs) That's right, man. When, so when I was, uh, I started this nonprofit and I applied to do one of those like local TED talks, you know, you can do those like TEDx talks. And my, my little spiel was that we're asking like in schooling, in like middle and high school, we're asking kids the right questions, but in the wrong order. We're asking them in like elementary, middle, high school, hey, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you grow up? And we never actually help them figure out who they were made to be. Mm, yeah. And so what happens? Why is the college dropout rate insane? Like literally I, the, when I was doing the research for this TEDx, I think we're like second from last on college completion rate, like Poland or Iceland or someone was down beneath us. But I think the reason is, <laughs> why them? Okay. That's where my brain goes. How are they worse than us? <laughs> I know, right? How could you get any worse? But uh, it's like we, we get to college and we were confronted with this whole reality that what you thought you were going to do or be interested in is, has really no bearing. You're actually starting to find out who you are and it has nothing to do with what you want to do. So 
if we could get kids to understand in, I don't even mean kids, like just people to understand who they are, like be confident, be sure of who they are. Not even, not even like a self-esteem, just like, like, am I a business owner or am I a father and a husband? Am I what, like, that's a question I ask myself. Do I define myself by what I'm doing or simply who I am? Cause if I know who I am, I can find joy and, and satisfaction in whatever I do. But if I look to learn joy and satisfaction and fulfillment from what I do, that's a dangerous place to be, man. You'll never know who you are and you'll probably be searching for that your whole life. No doubt on that. No doubt. There's a, you and I both come from a, a church ministry background. You know, I was, I was leading a church in worship when I was 18 years old, when they asked me to take the thing and then the, the pastor resigned the lead pastor resigned and then the board was like, well, Rick, I guess it's yours until we find somebody else. I was 18, man. Wow. You know, the, and that was like mind blowing to me. It was a smaller church, but still 200 people when you're 18, you're like, Oh goodness. You know, and I, I got this thing here, you know, and then it, it, it worked out. Okay. Right. And that was fantastic. But one thing I've learned too, because I've always been sort of like bivocational is the word, you know, I've been in the ministry side of things that, you know, I'm not anymore right now, but then I was also running a business as well. And it intrigues me because you have some of the same similar experiences that I do. How did you take what you had from your nonprofits, right? Or ministry into your for-profits, the knowledge there, or even the knowledge from your for-profit into like a ministry, how, what correlations or overlaps did you see there, how they benefit each other? Yeah, that's a, this is a great question. I mean, so in in nonprofits, what I love to do is serve. I mean, I love the service aspect. Of it, you know, I love the fact that like, you know, I could do something for the good of the thing that should be done. This is the right thing to do. We should do it. You know, so to speak. You don't have to exchange, you know, monetary value for this thing. It's just the right thing to do. Um, I loved that, and then I also loved the like sort of the, always the holistic ability where, um, you know, when you're in sales, like I did sales for a while, when you're in sales, like, yeah, I want to talk to you. I want to hear about your business. But at the end of the day, I better walk out the door with your money and you better have one or more of my products in your hand so that whatever my boss is happier so that I get paid my commission or there, you always had to have this like exchange. And so it always felt like it felt like loaded, not really genuine conversations. Whereas in the nonprofit sector, you're doing good for the good of what should be done. You're, you're having authentic relationships and actually listening to people no matter where it leads. Um, I love that. Um, so in the for-profit world, like whether it's running my own business or helping people start theirs, it's like at the end of the day, I want people's experience with me to be like well-served, you know, like it's about listening. It's about hearing what's actually being said as opposed to, what I have preconceived notions and ideas about, and then figuring out how can I help you. And in the for-profit world, the sort of exchange, if you will, of monetary, you know, stuff that helps me live and feed my five kids <laughs> happens, you know, usually in that interaction or, or after that interaction. Whereas in the nonprofit world, you know, conceivably, you get your money way later from the grant or you got your money already. So you didn't have to work, take it in. Does it, it make sense? It's like, it does. It's still yeah. Serving, serving, serving to me. Coming from that realm too. It, it, well, it has to be right. It has to be serving either way. And I w doing both nonprofit and for-profit at the same time for me. And then mo moving into solely, not solely for profit. And at some point I'm establishing a foundation again, which would be nonprofit. So it seems like this cyclical thing to where it's really beneficial because they feed off of each other. Yeah. And it's fantastic. So when I was in in the church realm in ministry, you know, with everything that I did, I mean, church, I've dude, I've played in front of thousands of people before. I've helped plant three different churches as the number two. I never wanted to be the number one guy. And I've turned down salaries in that realm too, paid positions because I, I've said, you know what, that's not my gig. And yeah. plus I wanted to be a little bit of a renegade because I felt like that would control me because money has a weird effect on people, man. You know, you know that, yeah. Yeah, but then yeah. I could just be free from that to do whatever I felt was right in those moments too. And that's also how I feel that the, the nonprofit side has helped the for-profit side because now I, I, when I've had trouble clients like anyone's had, you know, and when I come into it, it's like the examination is, did I serve this person the right way? 
Did I do everything right that I possibly could for them? And as long as that box is checked, for me, it doesn't matter if I keep them or lose them. Because it's no longer on me at that point to feel guilty or could I have done one more thing? Because I know that I literally brought all of me, I went all in or my team went all in for that client, just like a pastor would for one of his congregants or for his church. Yeah. So, I mean, to be, again, just to be real, real, probably an hour before we had this conversation, I was on the phone with a client and he was explaining really what he needed to be done. It's like way outside of scope of what, what we knew or thought when we, we started our engagement together. And I told him what I would, like I said, yeah, basically I'll do that, all that, do that, 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 that. And I hung up the phone and my, you know, well-intentioned, honestly, good dude that was on the, my, the call with me, one of my other um, business partners, he called me back. He literally like, just called me and said, Justin, you're giving that guy like $2,000 worth of like our work just doing it. I said, yeah, that's what he needs though, man. I mean, I'm not saying that to my horn at all. It's just, you're right. When you operate out of this mentality of like, if I, like, circling back, man, if I really trust the man upstairs, look, it, it's in his hands, you know, I'm going to do what needs to be done, you know, I'm not going to force his hand or, and he's got to do something for me. This is, it's just, we got to do, we got to love one another. You know what I mean? We got to serve one another. We got to trust that like the good that we show is going to reap a harvest. And I'm not talking necessarily all karma ish type stuff. I'm just saying, why don't we just focus on serving and just, yeah. Yeah. Don't yeah. always have to have the exchange. I'm with you. And that you work um you work a lot with startups, don't you? And entrepreneurs yeah. versus yeah. established businesses. You know, yeah. and when you work with startups, for the most part, okay, they don't have much money to begin with. You know, kind of like a church. <laughs> <You like that. laughs> exactly. But still, so there's gotta be some kind of personal fulfillment there too. You know, why do you choose to work with startups and entrepreneurs rather than more established businesses? It's a great question. I mean, I feel like um, I, I am a starter. Um, I have, you know, launched and tried to sustain and not done well with a lot of other adventures in my life, whether it's a nonprofit or for profit. And I just have come to realize, man, I'm a starter. Number one. Um, number two, I I love um, like potential is like my junkie drug, like. <laughs> isn't it though you got yeah. that thing too right in your head to where it's like oh i see what this could be yeah oh you know what and i don't see any reason why i can't or maybe i see 99 reasons why i shouldn't do that but i see one single one why i should go after that so that's it, enough for me our put my poor wife you now you now everyone understands right like so because it's always it could be this and so for me after doing that for a while i realized you know what I'm, I'm at least good at the, the first few stages where I can help, you know, know, discern. And, and honestly, um, there's been really cool business partners that came along in my life four or five years ago that led me to start my, my company now that had that other piece of the puzzle. They could actually then look at data and they taught me how to like objectively evaluate and analyze ideas, whether they're good or not, whether there's opportunity or not. So be able to bring to be able to bring that to like an entrepreneur who also has a dream. I mean, mm-hmm. A dream and a vision, man, those aren't things that we, th- those are things from outside of us that we're given to either steward or discern and, and hand off to someone else. That's how I feel. So I get to play the role of helping people understand like, that's a great idea. Here's how we can make it a, a little better based on some data. Or you know what? It's a well-intentioned idea, but you'd be taking a huge risk to do that right now. And it's going to take a lot more work than you probably realize at this point. So I I just love that. I love bringing ideas to life um, for people. That's the creative, right? And that's, that's, that's the space that I love to work in too. And that, those are visionaries, man. That's how we roll. Exactly. You know, how do you use that creative energy to be successful? Because it's great that you're helping other people, but how do you focus that back to yourself, you know, within business and even outside of business, maybe in your family? It's a good question. I mean, I, I, um, in my business, like I don't want to run. So I'm sorry. I can't give you like straight, simple answers. I went to school from like Columbus, landlock Columbus, Ohio to landlock Lancaster County, Pennsylvania to study oceanography. 
Why? What? That's not on your form here. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's my degree, man. Oceanography and hey, geology. The 26%. <laughs> there you go. That's yeah. right. That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> but why? Because I, I just know I don't want my job to be the same every day. I don't want to wake up Groundhog Day style and be doing the same thing over and over. So for me, like, how do I bring creativity into my business? It's like, I know the, the sparrow I'm running today is not the sparrow I want to run six months, a year from now. Like, it needs to grow, infuse, adapt. So honestly, I, I believe that I'm not the source of all those ideas. And so instilling creativity into my business and how we pursue what we do, how we do it is really like, it involves prayer. It involves looking at opportunities around me that maybe other people are afraid of engaging in people that um, like, I'll give you an example, like post incarcerated individuals flooding the streets or people who chose to raise their babies instead of go to college, but are now having babies going to college. What kind of work opportunities do they have? So for me, I'm like, man, how does, is there a way that I could help those people? Like, how do I make sure that, you know, my business doesn't get boring for my employees, for myself. That's kind of how I just, I never wake I will never want to wake up to the same day. Um, does that make sense? Oh, it does, man. That's with me too. It's the same thing. Oh. Uh, and th that's, there's sort of two people, I guess, that exist in this world, right? And you should read the book Rocket Fuel because it, oh, there's, oh, I know that. yeah, it, visionaries versus integrators. And it's amazing yeah. because the integrators are the ones that really kind of rule the world because they're getting the job done. They're actually doing the doing. And then it's the visionaries that are like, you know what? I'm going to have multiple different new businesses or ideas that I'm going to come up with on a day-to-day -day basis and then chart the course. You know, mm -hmm. And that's you and me because we feel that we would get brain damage if we would go down into the integration for too long. And that's yeah. why we like to stay in the creative aspect of it. You know, then the integrators are really the ones do that make our stuff happen. And I, I love that about integrators because it's, uh, I mean, I, I try to surround myself with the best possible integrators because I know that I'm going to go chase the next shiny thing <laughs> that comes in, in yeah. front of me just to see if it could possibly work out. That's it. You know, if nothing else, then just see if it could work. Yeah, no. And I think, I mean, I, I was just interviewing a guy the other day and he was like, he said, um, yeah, I don't know. I really like, you know, finishing and, and like sustaining stuff. And I'm like, oh. Yep. God, yep. Um, today. <laughs> There's the yang to the yin, right? <laughs> exactly. Yep. Exactly. It's like, yep. So no, that's cool. I, I mean, so I homeschool, I, I shouldn't say I, my wife is incredible. She homeschools our five. Good man. In case she's listening. There you go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, um, but creativity is where I feel like you said, like, even how does it even play into like family? It's like, same thing, man, is, is just how do we make, my kids understand that actually she says a really smart thing. She says, if you're bored, it's your own fault. And that's a good thing. Like, wow, you got to stay creative. You got to stay. Yeah. You are created. That means you are creative. So I love that, man. That, that muscle. You've got a creative company too. Yeah. Sparrow websites. Yeah, we do. We, I mean, we try and keep it creative. That's awesome. I want everybody to be able to find you too, man. Sparrowwebsites.com. I'm going to, I'm going to check that out too. Uh, I, I love it, man. I love your story and we're, uh, I wish we could keep talking for an hour, but I'm taking a look at everything. I think this was a really good conversation today. I not think it was a really good convo. Did you lift me up today? Thank you. I appreciate it, man. No, it's, it's always fun to hear. Uh, and I appreciate the conversation too. Just, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, as people that are, are trying to always help, it's always uh, equally good to talk with someone who's sometimes thinking down the same same way of like and appreciating some of the hard lessons and the life lessons along the way. So I love so. it. Go check out Justin Rule, sparrowwebsites.com. And man, thank you for being on today. And with that, I'll say see ya. See you, man. What's shaking? Thank you for joining me on the All In Podcast. Click the subscribe button and smash that bell for notifications. Text me, 312-535-8520. Follow me on social media at Mr. Rick Jordan. See you next episode. I am Rick Jordan and I approve this message.